that mind of God, if you uh, want to summarize it into, uh, crystallize it into a single theme, it is a kingdom of God. And then we have seen about way of the cross as the mind of Christ or the way to the cross is the way to the mind of the cross. Okay, now uh, in this session, we will be talking about cruciform mind. That means the mind of Christ as reflected on the cross. Now, I'll be sharing with you five shades of cruciform mind. Since I'm not sharing the slides because I have already uh, sent the slides to Arun, uh, I hope uh, he will share the slides or else I will do it. Anyway, okay, the first aspect of cruciform mind is agapeic mind of Christ. That means the mind of Christ reflects the love of God. There are different types of love. Agape, Firos, Philia, and Eros. But what we see on the cross is agapeic love. And how do we understand the agapeic nature of the mind of Christ. Of course, in the, uh, on, on the cross, we see a love of Christ. But there is something which is very unique uh, to the love which was manifested on the cross. Jesus said, you love one another. Loving one another is rooted in your love of God and love for God. In Matthew 22 verse 39, a teacher of the law came to Jesus and asked him, which is the most significant, which is the most important law in the Old Testament? Jesus said, the first and the foremost commandment of the law is to love God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. And then Jesus did not stop there. He said, the second one is as important as the first one. In some translations, you would see that the second commandment is equally important to that of the first one. What do you mean? The first and the foremost commandment of the law, of the word of God, is to love God. Jesus said this is the first and the foremost commandment. And then he says the second one is as important as the first one. The second commandment is equal to the first one. Now you would wonder what was that the second commandment which is treated equally with that of the first one. The second commandment is love one another. So the mind of Christ means loving God is equal to loving your neighbor. In Matthew 25 verses 31 to 46, we see uh, a narrative on the last judgment where all the people are summoned before the throne of the, the Lamb. And then people will be divided into two. On the left you will see the curse and on the right you will find the blessed. And what is the difference between the curse and the blessed? The curse wanted to love God and to serve God. But they, they couldn't find to where God is. But the blessed are those who serve the poor, the serve, the last, the least and the lost without even realizing that they are in fact serving God, the Almighty. So, uh, my, the, so my first point with regard to the theme, the mind of Christ is this. What is the first possible meaning that you can come up with? as you unpack the theme, mind of Christ. That is, the mind of Christ is agape. 
loving god is equal to loving neighbor the first and the foremost commandment is loving god but the second one is equal to the first one the second one is as important as the first one and what is that second commandment love your neighbor so agape nature of the mind of christ the second one is the humanistic nature of the mind of christ you remember in the first session we had discussed about the mind of god the understanding about god god is not a tribal god god is not an ethnic god god is not god cannot be confined to any particular territory to any particular piece of land god is the god of the entire universe god is the god of whole cosmos so your if your understanding of god is tribal and ethnic your understanding of humanity will be ethnic and tribal so the mind of christ is inviting us to a new understanding of humanity and god which is not tribal which is not ethnic which is not genetical which is not genealogical and which is not gene based the mind of christ depicts a new humanity which is not gene based or genetical or genealogical and there is only one criteria to define humanity and that is the image of god and not the gene and the genetics it is the image of god that unites us not my skin not my genes not my complexion not my looks and not my whims and fancies not my costume not my cuisine but the image of god so the mind of christ invites us to understand humanity in a very different way in a way that is patterned after the love of cross manifested on the cross that is called cruciform humanity let me cite you a few examples wherein you will find uh, you come across a, a new humanity in jesus genealogy in matthew uh, verses 1 through 17 and luke chapter 3 there you will find the presence of three women who are not jewish who who do not belong to the so called people of god they are they are from other ethnic background they are from other cultural background they are from other religious system level who are they rahab ruth bethsheba and tamar is of course a jewish woman so why ruth and why rahab rahab is from the city called jericho and ruth is uh, a curd uh, ruth is from ruth hails from a cursed city called moab so a moabite woman and a woman from the city of jericho they are included in jesus genealogy jesus genealogy means jesus forefathers and foremothers how come ruth and rahab find a place in jewish gene jesus genealogy because in jesus we find a humanity which is not gene based or which is not genetical again a teacher of the law asked jesus what should i do to inherit eternal life and jesus said a parable and that we which we all know that is the parable of good samaritan and there jesus said there was a man who was lying on the on the road on the road side because he was attacked by robbers a priest passed by 
a Levite passed by, but they did not uh, look at the unfortunate man who was lying on the roadside. And then came a Samaritan. And he ministered to him, took him to the nearest inn. And he admitted him in and promised the innkeeper that if anything more to be done, I am more than happy to do it. And then Jesus said to the teacher of the law, you go and do likewise. So his question is, what shall I do to, do, uh, to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, you go and do what the Samaritan did and not what the Jewish people did. So Jesus' understanding of humanity is very much humanistic. So the mind of Christ is humanistic. So the understanding of humanity as reflected or uh, after the pattern of the cross is called the mind of Christ. You remember the first one? Loving God is equal to loving the neighbor. And the second one, the mind of Christ is humanistic. And again, Mark 7, 24, there Jesus he entered into a Gentile territory. There you read the story of a Syrophoenician woman. In Matthew's version, it is a Canaanite woman. Whether it is a Syrophoenician or a Canaanite woman, they come from a Gentile background, a heathen background, a pagan background where no Jew would dare to step in. But Jesus is trespassing that stigmatic boundaries. Jesus is deliberately crossing the boundaries and entering into a Gentile territory. Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. So in all these stories, you see the mind of Christ. In all these narratives, we see what the mind of Christ is all about. Here, the mind of Christ means humanistic. First one is agapeic. Second one is a humanistic. And the third one is ethical. So the mind of Christ is ethical. What do you mean by the ethical nature of the mind of Christ? You know, in Jesus' encounter with many people in the first century Greco-Roman world, we find that Jesus is not succumbing or Jesus is not subscribing to the notions of purity and pollution. Jesus is touching the leper. You know, when we read Leviticus, it says if you touch a leper, you shall be impure or you shall be unclean. But in Matthew 8, Jesus is touching the leper. He could have healed him without even touching him. But Jesus touched him. And then again, Jesus touching the dead body, Jesus touching the corpse. According to the Leviticus, if you touch a dead body, you shall be unclean. Again, Jesus encounter with the Canaanite woman, the bleeding woman. If you touch a bleeding woman, you shall be unclean. So whether it is touching the healer, whether it is touching the corpse, or touching the bleeding woman, Jesus is making an ethical initiative. Jesus is making an ethical move whereby he is consciously and purposely and deliberately trespassing the boundaries erected by the religious institutions of that time. So the mind of Christ is ethical. 
And more importantly, Jesus' attitude towards women also reflects the same. In Luke chapter 7, we see a woman anointing Jesus with an expensive ointment, with expensive perfume, exorbitantly expensive perfume. And Jesus was uh, at the house of a rich man called Simon. He was, Jesus was not given uh, due hospitality that he thoroughly deserves. In fact, he was more interested in, uh, in, in parading his extravagance, his richness, his luxurious house. And then there came a woman who was carrying an expensive alabaster jar which contains a very expensive perfume. And she anoints Jesus' body with that expensive ointment. She kissed her feet. If you read Luke 7.38 in the New Revised Standard Version, there it reads, Jesus, she continued kissing his feet. So here comes a woman who was continuously kissing Jesus. You remember that was in the first century uh, Jewish leadership was very much moralistic. But Jesus is ethical. So the mind of Christ is not moralistic but ethical. What is moralistic? Moralistic most of the time is related to man-woman relationship. Gentered of, gentering of relationship. It's all about the relationship between man and woman. It's not about justice. It is not about forgiveness. It is not about love. It is not about equality. It is not about equity. It is not about impartiality. It is not about fairness. It is all about gender. But Jesus deliberately breaking those gender boundaries. For him, love is ethical. Love is ethics. So what is the mind of Christ? It is ethical. So the first one is the mind of Christ is agape. Second, the mind of Christ is humanistic. Third one, the mind of Christ is ethical. Fourth one, the mind of Christ is non-compliant or defiant. Now if you look at Jesus' story, he always uh, consciously attacked the Jewish leaders. He was never ready to comply the Jewish moralistic rules and laws. Let's take the Sabbath conflict stories. That means the conflict happened, the conflict uh, occurred between Jesus and the Jewish leaders of the time. I'll give you two examples. The story of the plucking of the grain. Jesus and his disciples were walking through the paddy field and his disciples were so hungry, so much so, they plucked some grain, heads of some of the grain. And when the Jewish leaders saw it, they were so annoyed and they were so upset. They came up to Jesus and complained to him that your disciples are breaking the law of the Sabbath. And we very well know what was Jesus' response. Jesus referred to the example of David and defended the disciples. There Jesus says, what is more important is not complying to the laws of Sabbath when you are hungry. So food is more important than Sabbath. That is exactly what David did. 
So you might wonder why Jesus was not complying or subscribing to the law of Sabbath, which was so crucial for the Jewish community. Again in uh, Luke, we read Jesus healing about uh, Jesus healing a, a, a bent woman who was in that condition, physical uh, condition for 18 years, long 18 years. When Jesus saw that bent woman, he had mercy on her. So he summoned her and said, I'm going to heal you. When the leaders of the church, when the leaders of the synagogue saw Jesus intended to heal that bent woman, they complained, they protested. They said, how can you do this? And that too on a Sabbath. And Jesus said, which is more important? And there Jesus heals the bent woman. You know, that woman was not in a medical emergency situation. She could have afforded to wait for one more day or one more week or even a month. Because she had been in that physical condition for the last 18 years. So what was the urgency on Jesus' part to heal that bent woman on a Sabbath day? Which is against the law of Sabbath. So Jesus purposely violating the law of Sabbath. He is not complying to the law of Sabbath to show what is more important. It is not the law, but the love that is more important. So Jesus non-compliant nature. So the mind of Christ is also about non-compliance. It is also about defiance. It is also about being rebellious and practicing disobedience. So when you practice God's will, you might end up disobeying the will of the populace. What is right is not always popular and what is popular is not always necessarily right. So at times you will have to Practice non-compliance, disobedience. And you might wonder why I justify disobedience. I said disobedience is not a virtue in itself. It becomes a virtue when it is for doing the will of God. So if you practice disobedience on earth for the sake of being obedient to the will of God, that sort of non-compliance is what God expects. I'm not saying you should not respect your parents. I'm not saying you should not obey your parents. What I'm saying is at times you may have to disobey the elders or the parents it is a virtue, it is the mind of Christ, so long as it is for the sake of doing the will of God. That is what Jesus does. He is not subscribing the law because he is subscribing to a higher law, which is the law of God. So mind of Christ can also mean non-compliance or disobedience and finally mind of Christ means fraternal it's all about friendship Jesus said I call you no longer slaves but friends so we are friends of Christ that is our stature you know in other gospels and in Romans, we say we are the children of God. But in John's gospel, Jesus said, I call you my brothers. So what is our status? So church is all about fraternity. Church is all about fraternity. Being a child of God means being fraternal. Mind of Christ means being fraternal. 
Jesus was the friend of tax collectors and sinners. In all the Gospels, Synoptic Gospels and in John's Gospel, one thing that you find very frequently in Jesus' life is Jesus' friendship with tax collectors and sinners. His stable fellowship with the unwanted. His stable fellowship with the riffraff. The less privileged, the unfortunate. He was very friendly to all the people, irrespective of what their social capital is, irrespective of what their cultural capital is, irrespective of where they come from, irrespective of whether they are righteous or sinful, irrespective of whether they are man or woman, irrespective of whether they are rich or poor, he was friendly to all those who need his friendship. So the mind of Christ means being friendly. We are friends and we have friends. But we are very choosy when it comes to friends and friendship. Most of the time, our friendship is a deliberate choice. We choose our friendship on the basis of money, education, beauty, religion, and so on. Are we reflecting the mind of Christ? If you are truly following the mind of Christ, if you truly embrace the cruciform mind, you will be fraternal. Friends of everyone. No matter who they are. No matter what they are. No matter what the world think about them. You love them. You are friends with them. Because that is what the mind of Christ is all about. Let me stop here. I was trying to uh, share five shades of mind of Christ. Mind of Christ is agape. Mind of Christ is a humanistic. Mind of Christ is ethical. Mind of Christ is non-compliant. And mind of Christ is fraternal. And thank you buddies. And thank you guys for your patient listening and careful attention.